All right. Um, first of all, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Thanks, Rhonda, for organizing this, and thanks, Rims, for having me here. And good morning, everyone. Is this working? <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. So I have to hold it then. All right. Okay. So it's show time. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, just a, a brief introduction of myself. I'm Lily, and my name is Lily Liu. And then um, I work as a PT uh, in my home country before I came to the U.S. And I work in a, a National Stroke Association of Malaysia before as a PT. And uh, many years working as a PT, like over 20 years, and I noticed that the emotional aspect of stroke survivors are kind of neglected, not addressed fully, and therefore I went back to school. And then I uh, did my master's in counseling, clinical counseling, and then uh, here I am as an intern, clinical counselor intern, and also a um, working uh, some PT work with some stroke survivors here. And I uh, volunteered at the Glendora after stroke. And that's where I met Randa there. Therefore, um, so today we're going to talk about emotional changes after a stroke. Okay? And um, please feel free to stop me at any time that you think that I'm, I'm speaking in Chinese that you don't understand. <laughs> so please stop and please interact with me. Okay? Let's take this time as a time of uh, sharing of experiences. Um, talking about emotions that many times we don't like to talk about, all right? It is something that we may just push it aside, or it may be something that we just don't allow ourselves to talk about it, all right? We have so many appointments after a stroke. Appointment PT, OT, speech, and whatnot, okay? And then emotion, emotional part is the last thing that many times we, we address it, or we may not address it at all, okay? So, is there any questions so far? Stand over here, is it all right? Can you see? The board? Okay. Now, objective today. We're going to play on this, trying to achieve these three objectives. Firstly, is to understand what are some of the common emotional changes we have after a stroke. All right? And recognizing those signs and symptoms. And also, what coping How is emotion basically through two to prefrontal cortex? That's your limbic system. So a stroke happened there, right? So the blood a ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke happened at the Our emotion. So when it happens, me, you know, sometimes angry and what some of the emotions. And the other the way of uh, how emotions affected is is a response to a traumatic life changing event. Having a stroke is a life changing event. All right? One day you're walking, you're going to as usual, you know, you get doing your own, doing things, doing daily life, and suddenly a joke happens, and your life you have to learn all how to dress, take care of yourself, all the activities. So it just is a traumatic, life-changing. Response. So we have certain intense emotions in response to these traumatic events. All right. So it, it is common response. It is only natural. Sometimes we sometimes it's so sad, so much loss and grief. So is that is affected. Tell me or just share. What are some of the common emotions that you have after a stroke? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, good. Depression, anger. What else? Frustration. Mm -hmm. What else? Pity party. Yeah, yeah. Pity party. Pity. Feeling sorry for yourself. Pity. Pity party. Depression. As we know, there are that really sad go into clinical depression or major depression. There are various um, signs and symptoms. There's, there's some classifications that when your mental health physician or your mental health clinician will diagnose you as clinical depression. Yeah, sadness. Yes, uh, extreme sadness. Okay. What else? Self-conscious, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we feel embarrassed or when we are so self-conscious, um, what kind of emotions that will go through or, or you will experience when you want to go out into public places? You don't have confidence. You feel anxious, right? Hey, can I make it? Will I like go to a wedding and it's supposed to be a happy occasion and I cry non-stop. We'll talk about that. How come? Alright, so we call it emotionalism. Yeah? Or, can I meet up with my old friends? I'm walking this way now. I'm walking with a cane. I may not be able to manage those steps. So, a lot of fear. Lack of confidence. Okay, a lot of anxiety. Okay, embarrassment. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Anger, depression, anxiety, anger, BPA, emotionalism, and personality changes. We're going to talk. We're going to touch on that a little bit afterwards. Okay, and we're going to go through that. What? Okay. We, firstly, we're going to go to depression. It's a persistent low mood and loss of interest or pleasure, and deterioration in a person's function, which lasts for weeks. Okay, so and also there are a few signs and symptoms that go together with depression, which is on the next slide. And Extreme says that it's very important that we address the emotional uh, component of, of a stroke survival or in your stroke recovery journey because stage of stroke survivors suffer from depression, one in four. Okay, and when depression sets in and not addressed early or not addressed adequately, then you will go into poor recovery, which is very strong uh, evidence that shows that uh, stroke survivors who is depressed, the recovery period. Of okay, how so? You see, when you are depressed, you don't have motivation. All right. You, you go into depressed depressed quickly at the beginning. Depression, it may go into further, deeper into de clinical depression. Okay, because you has you have low motivation when you're depressed. Yeah, low motivation, and with this low motivation, you don't feel like doing any rehab. And being a pity, I have heard patients say that I'm very sadistic. When the patients can do something, I say, "Oh, that's good." Let's keep it a notch higher. Let's go a little bit more. You can walk one mile. Yay, well done. Good job. Let's go the second mile. So there's always a goal to reach. All right? Always something. But if you have low motivation, say, ah, oh, it's so hard. Just to leave my hand, to put on the, the shirt, is so, so, so difficult. Okay? And with that, you have hospital stay. You have less social activity. And then you poor physical outcome, and therefore it's kind of like you're being isolated even further, right? So it's, it's a recovery depression. So it's important that we address this early. Anything? Thanks, Roxy. Point. Yes, many times when we feel depressed or we angry or upset. For you, you're angry at God, upset at God. For us, we can have so many things that we can be upset about after a stroke. And even feeling depressed, we may not know, okay, that we have these things going on, that we are struggling these things. And we thought that we are, we are struggling on our own. 
Okay, there are many other people who will also have the same expression of feeling as Roxy has. Angry at someone. Angry mm. at God. Okay, or you cannot, you should not feel depressed. Depression is only for the weak. There you go. Okay, mm. so you shouldn't feel depressed. Hey, this is life, man. Get up and walk. Huh? Pity party? Hey. Get up and walk and put food on the table. Right? So this is the, these are the things that we don't address. Therefore, right now, we want to bring it out. Because we know, if you do not address depression, it's going to affect your recovery. Huh? Okay, what are some of the signs and symptoms of depression? Just throw up. What are some of the symptoms? What are some of the signs? That's it. Lethargy, not having any energy. What else? Tidiness. Hmm? Tidiness. Tidiness? You are not feeling yourself. Okay. Tidiness. Tidiness. Okay, what else? All right. So we have diminished interest and pleasure. Depressed mood is, is a given. Okay. So your expression is no smile, no joy. All right. It's, it's a very sad face. So it's a given. Mark diminished interest and pleasure. That is also one of the things that we look for in diagnosing clinical or major depression. Very very well or not near retardedness in your movement. Okay, so it, perhaps in the you take uh, an interest of when you come from okay or when you go out to the mall because of depression you just don't care anymore. Lose interest. And for stroke survivors. I have heard this quite a lot. Feeling, feeling of worthlessness. All right, feeling of like being a burden to your caregivers. Okay, so um, stroke survivors they struggle with these emotions. Intense, sometimes can be very intense. Okay, negative emotions. Suicidal thoughts is another one. All right. Okay, so when we have depression, so now that we know what are some of the signs and symptoms, right? So if you have someone um, losing, not having enough sleep, losing energy, or keep saying that, oh, it's okay, I don't need to go out, I, um, I don't want to be a burden to you. Let's say you're talking to your children or your children wants to take you out for a meal or to the mall. You say, oh, no, it's all right, I just stay home. You guys go ahead. You know, it's too troublesome. I don't want to be a burden to you all. Let me just stay at home. I'm fine. You know, and stay at home and not eating well and not taking care of yourself. So that is not a good sign. Yeah. So we know when we can recognize what depression, what some of the signs, the common signs and symptoms, then what can we do? What do you think that you can do? Or what do you think that you can help as a caregiver? To be hmm? Keep ourselves busy. Keep ourselves busy. Good point. How? We limited chores at home. Okay, great. Exercise. Yeah. And I, I like the point that you say by doing chores, limited chores. So we do not want to look at the disabilities, we want to look at the abilities. What can I do at home to keep myself busy? Right? Good point. Exercise. Exercise is another good uh, stress or depression booster because when we do aerobic kind of exercise, we walk, get some sunlight, then it will help lift our mood. Okay? It will improve our hormones, serotonin, that, that it will help lift our, yeah, our mood and our outlook. Okay? What else? 
Exactly. Talk. Okay. That is why stroke support group is so important. I can never emphasize enough. I work in the stroke um, uh, support um, National Stroke Association. And the support is so important. Because once you discharge from the hospital, discharge from the rehab hospital, you're into the community. And many times the rehab hospital do not have adequate preparedness or preparation for survivors to go out into the community. Okay? So this is where when we come together we talk about it. Yeah? It helps. Anything else? Any any other ways that we can what we can do? Watch T V? Okay. What kind of program? Whatever. The soap opera that makes you cry more. <laughs> Or the comedy that makes you laugh. <laughs> so, yeah, watching TV is another pastime, another way that we can not think about our situation, can temporarily uh, help us distract, right? Transfer us to another place, right? So, then transfer us to another place. That is nice. Okay, but if transfer us to a more sad place, that is going to cause us to feel more. Yeah. Yes, Bob? Um, depending on how bad the depression is, you can, uh, should seek uh, professional help, mm -hmm. psychiatrist or psychologist, mm -hmm. you know, maybe need medication sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. So if you're depression, clinically depressed and uh, we're doing all these things together, and uh, if then we, we may seek professional help at some point. Right. And it has been um, very well researched. Medication helps with depression and talk therapy or some psychotherapy. If you do it uh, combination, it helps. Okay. okay. And some relaxation techniques. Anybody does um, uh, meditation? Anyone does meditation? So meditation, mindfulness. No, okay. So things like this will help, okay? Coloring. Coloring helps, okay? Huh? Puzzle. Something that can temporarily distract us, okay? That we will not dwell or ruminate in this present situation that give us some form of like... Some people say it as an escape. It's not really an escape. It's a form of some relief, okay? I just have to clear my mind, and then I'll come back and tackle this, all right? It is very difficult for me to hold this cup using my weak arm. I want to take a break. Do it, go and do something else, and then come back, and then I will try again. Try again, and again, and again, okay? Uh, the thing is that goals, smart goals, smart. Anybody in management knows about smart? S specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-oriented goals. Okay. For example, after a stroke, if I say that in three months, if I have a dance stroke, okay, a dance stroke. And I say that in three months, I want to run for someone in May, but it is very slim chance, right, for you to be able to do that. All right. So therefore, if you set your goal too lofty and you cannot achieve that goal, then what's going to happen? How do you feel when you cannot achieve those goals? You feel down, you feel like you're failed. All right. Right. So therefore, when we set goals, you want to set measurable, attainable goal. Right. So instead of saying that I want to run a full marathon, I might say that, okay, I want to get up from this bed, I want to use a cane and walk around my house. Okay, if I can do that within a month, then for the, for the three months mark, I want to walk around this block. Okay. So something like that, which is attainable, is it relevant? 
Yes, of course, it's very relevant, very meaningful. It shows that I can walk out of the house. Relevant and time oriented means you must have you must attach a time to your goal. Okay, we can go on. Okay, so we have touched briefly on depression. All right, and now we go on to anxiety. Anxiety. What's the definition? It's physical and psychological response of a fearful or threatening situation. Okay. Now, what are some of the triggers? What are some of the things that will make you anxious? That will make you feel anxious? Anybody want to share? You before easily. But now you cannot do it. It will take you a longer time. Can you give an example? Like buying shoes, uh, uh, reading with one hand in a book, uh, so many things that you usually do in a split second. Now it will, will take you. A day or so, sometimes a week. Thank you. Yeah. The things that we 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 do in a split second. Yeah. We 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 just do it without even going through the process of doing it. But now it's like we have to think. Oh, can I do it? Okay. Can I take this tour? Can I can I can I buy this pair of shoes? Can I manage the shoelaces? Or do I have to buy a pair of shoes that without shoelace? That kind of thing, right? So we have to think about all these things. All right. If I go to these restaurants that I have not been before, am I able to negotiate those steps? Do they have disabled parking? Do they is the is the restroom accessible? These things. All right. So we 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 are fearful. We are anxious about these things that we used to. Take for granted that we can do in a split second. Okay, what other things are we anxious about after a stroke? Get better. So how? What is it that you anxious? Will I be able to get better? Am I hearing that? Yeah. Mm. Will I? How long? Yeah. Yes. Is that a common question that we ask ourselves after a stroke? Will I get better? Will I get back to before? How long? How long it takes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, will I have another stroke? That's another. Exactly. One. Yes. Yes. Will I have another stroke? And all these are very pertinent questions. Very real fear that we have. Okay. Um. So, for example, a, a friend of mine had a TIA. Do you know TIA, transient ischemic attack? Had a TIA, and he recovered from the TIA. And both husband and wife they run a catering business. And when the hus after the after the TIA, when the husband was out doing errands, the wife was so full. Okay, how come it's five minutes late? He's not back yet. Has he had a stroke on the road on the street? What's happening? Fearful, okay. And also for the husband who had a TIA, say, can I manage? Can I do this? You know, is it too much for me? You know, yeah. The fear of getting another stroke. Yeah, very real. Yes. My husband had a stroke, and what I'm seeing is that there is great concern that he really doesn't know who he is. Mm. I mean, for all his life, he's defined himself as a certain person with family responsibilities mm. and work and, and, you know, certain skills. Mm. And now those have been taken away from him. Not the family, obviously, but, you know, he, he can't take care of his family. He can't do those things that he used to do. There's financial concerns. And there's, like, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm a failure. And I think that's his biggest concern. I know he wakes up, like, at 3 o'clock in the morning, coming off ceilings and walls with that. Yeah. For sharing that, yes. Yes. Because many times we have our identity. Alright, I'm I'm the I'm the breadwinner. Okay. 
I, I have this position in this company. And now that after a stroke, I can't work. Okay? And how would my children see me? All right? So we have this concern. Exactly. Thank you for sharing. Financial too. Financial concern. Okay. I had one client. He was a orthopedic surgeon. Uh, a young chap. He had his stroke in his mid 40s, which means the kids are still young. Okay. So I think at that time the youngest one was uh, in kindergarten, uh, preschool, right? That age five or six. And during his stroke recovery period, so my client did not go back to the hospital, did not work, so he took medical leave. And he, he kind of like, okay, he sent the, the child to the school. So walk with the child. And then just a few feet away from the, the gate, the entrance to the school, the child turned around and said, Daddy, you don't follow me anymore. I can go in by myself. Then say, why? What's happening? Um, I don't want my friends to see the way you walk. Sad. It's really sad. So, so this is this this can happen. Okay. Yeah, love anxiety, a lot of your identity change. I'm a surgeon, you know, for the past well, ever since I graduated from school, and now I cannot even put gloves into my hair. I cannot even do the surgical scrub or or, or put on the gown things like that. Okay. Fear of falling, you know, okay, when you have balance. Uh, fear of being feeling embarrassed in situations, social situations. Okay. Okay, what are some of the signs and symptoms of anxiety? It's muscle tension, your heart rate increase, sweating, spasticity will increase. Okay, so when you see if you are in a environment that's new to you and you're feeling anxious, some of you, some stroke survivors will have the spasticity, right? So it keeps doing like that, like that, and then all your leg will go into clonus, and then it's so difficult to walk, right? Sleep disturbances, right? Someone mentioned, like, yeah, am I able to, what, what about financial situation after a stroke I cannot work again. So you think about that, you get depressed, you get stressed out and sleep disturbances. It's, it's natural that we will have these things. Yeah? Okay, so what do we do when we're feeling anxious? First thing is to seek information. Okay? Being informed takes away fear due to uncertainties. Will I get better? You ask. How long does it take? So what so you will have the answer like for you, sorry I didn't get your name, Susan, the answer is that will I get better? It depends on you. How long? Well, it's a process, we don't know how long. Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, we, we try, we seek for information. Okay, will I get better? What is happening? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to come to PT, sit down, and ask me to stretch my hand forward? Or why do I have to come to PT and lift weights? Uh, uh, 10, 20 times. Good. Walk one mile. Good. Not enough. Two miles. That kind of thing. Why do I have to do that? Okay, will I get better by doing that? So we want information. Oh, by doing this, by doing PT, by doing... Intensive rehab by learning how to talk is going to change some of the pathway, the neural pathway. All right. So, oh, I see. This is going to happen. Well, what is going to happen in my brain is going. The brain plasticity will take over the function, and you're going to have neural pathway, and it's a skill. You have to do it again and again and again and again, very intensive. Okay, in order to create that new pathway that come, the other brain cells that are not injured to help the affected limb, the affected muscle. Okay, so we want to seek information. So by having some form of information, we may feel less uh, uncertain. We may feel that, okay, what I'm doing is actually meaningful. It will work towards my recovery. It will help me towards to my recovery. 
All right. So that may help to reduce some of your anxious thoughts. Yes, one. Okay. On that point, I would like to throw up to the group. Anybody wants to disagree that there's a time frame to your recovery? Six months. Is there a limit of six months? No? Hmm. Agree? I want to share something. And I'm right now working with a, starting to work with a group of Chinese doctors. And they have a very special therapy method. And also in the combination with the combination with the herbal medicine, and I've already confirmed that the herbal medicine are all all available in the United States. So you can go to the legal herbal medical medicine stores to get them. And uh, what they claim is they have treated people five year out, even ten year out, with significant injuries. So there's one person who is five year out, a third of his brain. Was in the in liquefied, and that person regained most of his capabilities with this therapy. So I'm right now testing this out. So I talked to this doctor, and he said, number one, many of the beliefs that stroke recovery is not possible is wrong. Number two, the time limitation is wrong. Number three, in today's medical world, the treatment the framework is, is not effective. So he is right now performing a a test on me. So he said, in about three to six months, you should see significant significant progress. So I say, all of you can watch me. How much I can progress? Thank you for the point. Yes, thank you, Wanda, for bringing that up. Yes, um, in the past, in the past, I think um, medical science or neuroscience is not so advanced. So that then the the Medical people or personnel will, will give you a time frame, six months or a year, okay? And yes, if you recover, like three to six months, if you recover, it's faster. Reason being is that whatever the swelling, okay, in the brain after a stroke, after a trauma, the swelling subsided and therefore the brain cells that are being kind of compressed, they cannot work. After that, it starts working again. Therefore, you see the recovery, right? But having said that, Whatever brain cells that are injured, it's injured, okay, at the, during stroke, during the occlusion, the blood circulation cutting off. But we can retrain the brain or other brain cells that have not worked this function before. We train that brain cells to work. Therefore, you will see your therapist asking you to reach forward. Hundreds of times, reach forward, reach forward. What are we doing? We are actually training those new brain cells or dormant brain cells to come and take over the function. Look, the brain cells for this function is injured, is dead. It cannot use, all right? But we have so many other brain cells that we have not tapped into yet. So come, wake up, work, all right? So we want to establish this neural pathway, we call it. So is, is this phenomenon of neuroplasticity. The brain is so plastic, it can take the form in any way you want. So at 80 years old, you can still learn how to play a guitar. You can still learn how to speak a new language. Because we are tapping into the brain cells that we seldom use or lie dormant. Okay, so there is art. Okay, we intensive and it may be a longer period. It's a journey, it's a process. Okay, I have to joke. I have to and I want to and on zero to one is only zero one. <laughs> no, a hundred to one backwards. So you count backwards to make it a little bit more high um, cognitive function, all right? Something like that to distract yourself. And um, touch sometimes, like say in a restaurant, you suddenly you met an old friend and you started, ooh, then maybe your caregiver may okay, take a few deep breaths, like that, all right? So distract, just, just cool away a little bit, yeah? And if you are really sad, when you're really sad and your tears, your crying is, is because of sadness, it's not because of BPA, then it's okay to cry. Alright? It's okay to cry. And there are some medications too for some emotionalism that is very strong, extreme immune, immo, 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 BPA. Uh, there are some medications that will help control part of that. Okay? 
There's an assessment you can check online and see whether you have that or not. Yeah. This site, you can go on that. I can send you the email. I mean, another um, emotion is anger. Okay? So it is an intense displeasure or offense or exasperation. And anger is a secondary emotion of hurt. All right? Feeling hurt, resentment, helplessness, frustration, or disappointment. So it's not a primary emotion. We feel hurt, we feel helpless, and therefore we don't know how to handle that, and it comes out in anger. We kind of lash out. Okay? And it's usually directed to family, caregivers, or for Roxy, it's directed to God, someone who cannot speak back to us. We can da 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 da. Alright? And then he cannot speak back. He cannot answer back. Okay? So that is, that, that's things like that. And then we direct our anger to our nearest and closest, usually the caregivers and family members. Alright? What are some of the triggers? What makes you feel angry after a stroke? What are some of the things that make you feel angry? Being able to do something, yeah, which you are so used of doing it, yeah. What else? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, you're fine. Patience. All of a sudden, in the group meeting, just patience. You know, he has aphasic, but these words will stick to him. Like, Breathe, it will shout out loud you know, to the whole group. That kind of, yeah, patience and just and breathe. All right. And thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Anything? Yes? I don't know if I pronounce this correctly, but could you address these culture can be in syndrome where they don't know what time of day it is? It's very disoriented. Circadian syndrome. Circadian. C I C A. Because I'm becoming suicidal here. Is 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 he a stroke survivor? And he has this. Before before the stroke. No. No. He wants to go to bed at five, and three hours later he'll come downstairs, and he's ready to start his day. And I haven't even gone to bed yet. And during the night, the same thing happens. He has no concept of what time of day it is, or. And I understand it's very common, but it's, I can't find anything on how to how to deal with it. At this point, I do not have any experience with my clients as such. But what I can think of is that usually for depressed patients or dep depressed clients, they would have this sleep pattern altered. All right. So having said that, I am not sure how this uh, circadian syndrome is strongly affected because of the stroke or is it because of the emotional or the psychological changes after the stroke. Okay, but I will read that up and then I can email to Wanda and then Wanda perhaps can pass the message to you. Or anybody else have this experience or know about this circadian syndrome post-stroke? No? Have you, you spoken to your neurologist about it? Uh, we actually have a uh, meeting with them on to me, I, it sounds like the circadian uh, uh, problem is related to like proprioception, because if you don't have proprioception, that proprioception is where you know your finger at, your leg, and your arm at space. In other words, if I close, close my eyes and I on the affected side, I don't, you know, I don't know where my arm is if I close my eyes. I mean, it feels like it, it feels like it's up here, or you know. so it sounds to me like it could be related to that because you don't know what time it is or you don't your body doesn't know what what time of day it is you know and so it sounds like it's similar so still linked with stroke um, the impact of stroke circadian syndrome I have to read that out whether it is directly impacted because of the stroke so it's like jet lag, like chronic jet yes, lag. Yes. Mm. how besides that is how how is he emotionally psychologically yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Share something, and that is that 
stroke survivors and their family members can can have very intense feelings, and sometimes a a well-intentioned statement will will trigger a a strong reaction, and it's really important that the that the that the therapist um, be aware uh, that uh, of that reaction and 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 help to bring some uh, reconciliation, some uh, some some understanding to it. Thank you for that. And um, to add on to a point, that Rim is that sometimes when it is acute rehab or or even or even outpatient rehab, you know, then we, we find that how come this patient is not putting in the effort? Then sometimes we are guilty of labeling clients. Oh, this patient is so lazy, not doing, you know, what it's supposed to do. Okay, but in actual fact, that there may be some uh, lack, severe lack of energy, lethargic. All right, because of the signs and symptoms of depression. Okay, this person, this client may be feeling very depressed and there's just no energy to put in any kind of effort or work. And then here we are, not understanding, okay, the emotions that's behind it, all the psychological effect that's behind it, and then we start labeling, oh, this patient is lazy, unmotivated, that kind of thing. Right, so it's, it's not helping at all. Yeah. Lily, I want to add it to what is Reem's comment, and I think Reem's comment very, very well. I cannot say better. Two, th two things. The, the survivors, we should learn to deal with these things, desensitize it. We should not overreact. And to the, to the therapist, it should, especially when the survivor is in the early stage, when the injury is very fresh, be cognizant. So we meet in the middle. Like in our family, I think, um, it's very encouraging that you know we have support system like this that allows family members to to be educated. Like in our case, I'm Bobby's wife, and we have a six-year-old. And sometimes, you know, it's it's hard to explain to a six-year-old why daddy's speaking so loud. Like many times, she would ask, "Are you fighting?" or "Are you?" So it it creates confusion. But then you have to, even as a you know small child, you have to educate. You have to continuously um, teach a child if. Probably for other people, they might, may misunderstand Bobby. Like when he speaks, like they might think he's angry or something. Like in church meetings or something, sometimes he speaks so loud and he gets so excited. So um, again, yeah, education is key. Anything else?